Hope. Thank you so much for joining me today. How are you doing? Thank you, Chloe. Good to be here. Appreciate it. Can you share a little bit about what it is that you do and, and how, you, how you got to where you are today? Well, I mean, like, I'm a writer. And like most writers, I wear a lot of hats. And so I write books, articles. I am a coach. I work in the grief and loss area, but I also do creative coaching. And I'm a speaker and I lead workshops and retreats now online. Pre-COVID, they were all in person. And I've been really getting a lot from your book, uh, The After Grief, your new book. Can you share a bit about what that's about? The After Grief is about the long, what I call the long arc of loss. And that is what loss looks like in our lives 5, 10, 20, 30, 50 years after the fact. My first book, Motherless Daughters, which is out in the US, the UK, and a number of other countries, was about the early loss of a mother and the long-term effect it has on women. But over the past 25 years, since that book was first released, I have come to appreciate that any loss during childhood, adolescence, or young adulthood has a profound echo effect that continues or reverberates all the way into the future. And that's what the after grief is about. It is about what how loss shows up, it continues to show up in our life decades later. It's not the same way that it did in the first year or two, of course, we all know that. It softens, it turns into something more bearable, but it still shows up for us from time to time. And I really wanted to explore that and see what it was like for others in addition to sharing what it's been like for me. And, and can you share a little bit about your own experience with, with loss? Sure. Um, my first big loss was when I was 17. My mother died of breast cancer. She had been sick for about a year and a half. And I went looking for a book for girls who had lost their mothers and there weren't any at the time. All the books on mother loss for women seemed to assume that you would be in your 40s or 50s when the death occurred because statistically that was much more common. And I kept looking for that book for about 10 years and then I decided to write it. Um, and I also lost my father when I was 40, which is still relatively young to be without parents. So um, I have two daughters of my own, so I am a mother, but I, I haven't been a daughter for you know, quite a number of years now. Yeah. And I know one of the things that you share in the book, which really kind of surprised me, I think you share about a survey. It was asking people how long they thought it should take to get over a loss. And I think something like two weeks was a really common answer that came up. And that's, you know, that's quite right. uh, surprising. And also, you know, people are really expecting themselves to get over something like that in such a short period of time. That's a lot, isn't it? It is. And those were, um, that, was, that was not my study, by the way. That was a study that was conducted by other researchers. They were man on the street interviews in the U.S., just saying to people, how long do you think it should take for someone to get over the death of a loved one? And the average answer was two weeks. And, you know, I'm not sure if we can extrapolate that to the UK, but I would venture a guess that we could. You know, that, that is a common belief in Western society, that grief is something that we get over or we push through or we get past or we leave behind. But two weeks, my Lord. I mean, think about it. In some religious traditions, two weeks is not even enough time really to do the funeral and the mourning period. But we see that that belief echoed in policy as well. You know, I mean, in the in the U.S., the average bereavement leave from the workplace, the average paid bereavement leave, is three days, and beyond three days, you have to go into personal days, sick days, or non-paid time off. And that's, I think, that's just a crime. I know that there's a movement in the in the U.K. and that I, I believe actually, if you've lost a child now, you can get more paid time off in the U.K. But in the U.S., it's, it's pitiful. You know, our, our, our relationship to bereavement leave is, is really needs some modification over here. Uh, and, and do you think that's connected to our, like our relationship with death and grief, how we, we kind of don't want to think about it or talk about it? Or it's still a taboo, amazingly, isn't it? It is. I think, I think we are becoming a much more literate society. I mean, Unfortunately, we've all had to cope with COVID in the past year, but it has brought issues of end of life, death, dying, bereavement into the popular lexicon, certainly into the media more. 
But um, I think it has more to do, honestly, with capitalism and productivity and getting people back into the workplace quickly. So it's probably a combination of both. Yeah. And I suppose talking about COVID, um, I suppose a lot of people are saying that we've got, you know, even if they haven't lost someone, um, you know, someone that someone close to them hasn't died, they, they feel that there's a sort of a grief about what's happened over the last year. Is that a type of grief that, that people could be experiencing? Absolutely. I mean, most of us have lost our prior way of life. We can't tap into or spend time with our social networks the way that we are accustomed to doing so. If we are fortunate to, enough to not have lost a loved one or a good friend to COVID, we may have lost someone to another cause of death. I and mean, that was still happening, obviously, all the, all the time. Some of us have lost jobs. We've lost our financial security. There's a lot of divorces and separations that are occurring. So there are many types of losses that have occurred in the past year. And yes, we um, there are grief responses that would occur as a result. But I also want to point out that many of us, certainly here in the U.S. and certainly in Los Angeles, where I live, have spent much of the past year in survival mode. We've been just trying to figure out how we're going to adapt to the multiple, you know, and continuous changes um, and the false hopes that, that we've been given, whether they were real or implied, and the restrictions and the lockdowns that come and go. And when you are in survival mode, it's hard to let it out and grieve because you need to feel safe and secure and protected and supported. And a lot of us haven't felt that way in the past year. So here in the U.S., this spring, I suspect, and perhaps in the U.K. too, that we are going to see some delayed or postponed grief bubbling up when the anniversary of the early COVID deaths occurs. That's coming up right around the corner. Um, actually, uh, later this month and or early March here in the U.S., and the anniversaries of the lockdowns, because grief is cyclical and we're going to feel it in our bodies. So we're going to feel, you know, the change in seasons, for example, or in temperature, or, you know, certain things will come around again that occur only at that time of year, maybe the Easter holidays. And, and they might reactivate grief responses or activate grief responses that were suppressed because we didn't feel safe enough to grieve back then. I mean, now that we're coming out, of we hope the worst of it with the vaccines, people might be feeling a little more safe, a little more of that safety or security. And we might be seeing grief responses. So I hope your listeners will understand that if they feel something that feels like grief, it, it probably is. It would not be unusual to be experiencing that at, at the one year anniversary. And I don't know if this sounds like a, a stupid question, but in terms of a grief response, what might that look like for people? Maybe they, they've never, they haven't lost someone, but they're feeling a lot of feelings and, and not realizing that it's grief, perhaps. There are no stupid questions, and that's actually a very good question. What, what, what might it look or feel like? It's going to be different for everyone, but you probably know in your body what it feels like to experience a loss or a big disappointment. Um, for some people, that might show up as a change in appetite or sleep patterns. In others, it may be a deep feeling of sorrow, a dip in functioning, feeling that even small tasks are too large to accomplish. It, there may just be a pervasive feeling of sadness that you can't put your finger on because it doesn't seem attached to anything situational at that moment. Um, some feelings of maybe helplessness or loss of control. My, it, it really depends on the individual because grief itself is so individual. We all experience it in different ways. Yeah, and I was wondering, from, from reading your book, it, it, you kind of describe grief as being like this process that, um, like I'm wondering if, is it a process that can be incomplete? And also, is there another aspect of that whereby people almost pressure themselves or beat themselves up about whether they're grieving in the right way? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there is, a, there is a pressure, I think, to achieve this state of acceptance or closure or resolution. I can't think of a word that I like less when applied to grief than resolution, because it also leads to the term unresolved. Unresolved mm -hmm. grief, meaning incomplete grief. I believe that we grieve to the best of our ability at any point in time. And if you were a child, that might have been very limited. You might have had very limited capacity at the time, either because the adults around you didn't support you, or maybe you just didn't understand 
what had happened or even what death meant if you were very young. And so children have to grieve in bits and pieces over the course of their childhood. It's staggered in a sense. Um, adults, I think we grieve to the best of our ability, but then 10, 20 years later, we may get a new piece of information or a new type of awareness or reach a life milestone where we really miss that person who has died and we'll have another, a resurgence of grief. You know, it will be a, 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 almost, it feels almost like a fresh grief episode, but it doesn't last as long as the initial, you know, it may just be a, a matter of anywhere from minutes to days. Um, occasionally weeks where we might be feeling sorrowful or really missing that person all over again. But um, typically it doesn't extend into months. If it does, then that's an indication that professional help might be necessary. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What would you say to people who are scared about someone dying. I think I talk to a lot of people and this is a big fear, kind of an anxiety, almost like something that's always in the back of their mind. They've got this huge fear about, you know, when, when they lose someone, about how they'll cope, what that will be like, sort of like a fear, a fear of grief, a fear, like a fear of loss. Are there things that people can do to kind of, I don't know, like prepare for that? Or would you have advice for people around, around that? You know, in psychological terms, it's called perceived vulnerability, this feeling that a bad thing can happen. It's it's more pronounced in people who have experienced loss in the past and know how disorienting and disabling it is, and they fear that happening again. So I have a couple answers to that question. If you're an adult who experienced a loss during childhood, and that has made you particularly fearful about loss in adulthood, it's important to remember you're not that child anymore, that as an adult, you have capacities and resources that you didn't have as a child to get yourself support and to take care of yourself in ways that you would have had to rely on the adults around you to do when you were younger. So it's really important because we often tend to regress emotionally and we feel like that 12-year-old or that 18-year-old again without remembering that we know, in fact, we are 35 or 50 and we have access to resources that can help us. Um, You know, if only worrying... Um, kept all our loved ones safe, right? Then I think we'd all opt for a perpetual state of concern. Um, But it doesn't, you know? And I think it's really important for us to remember that what we do have is the time with the loved ones right now, if they are still alive. And and to, to really commit to making the most of that time together. I mean, we all know how this ends. It's gonna end the same way for everyone. We just don't know when. So, you know, my commitment is to live each life, live each day as, you know, as joyfully and as fully as I can. Um, If I spend a day worried about someone dying, then it's a day when I wasn't tapping into that sense of happiness or joy. And and I'm not hard on myself. You know, sure, there are some days when I'm concerned. It's called death anxiety. You typically were afraid of ourselves dying, but certainly we can be afraid of losing people that we are dependent on, like partners or children. Um, I spent a lot of years worried about my children's safety. And I look back now and I think, gosh, you know, they're 19 and 23 and all those hours that I spent worrying, I wish I had back. I wish I had done fun things with them instead. I love that advice. Yeah, yeah. I remember going to a a talk once and a woman, I think she was, I can't remember what she was. She, She had this like model brain. I think it was an actual brain actually she was showing to the audience. And she was like, and she made a joke about the fact that we all die one day. And everyone in the audience made this kind of awkward laugh. And it was like people had, had not really realized. <laughs> I think we, we don't really think about the fact that we're all going to die one day. Or, or like we're quite in denial about it. Like it's like, oh, like, I don't know. It seems almost like a bit surprising sometimes. Um, I think we're in denial, basically. Well, I know that. I think we have to be in order to in yeah. order to stay safe, right? We have to have a fear of death to keep ourselves from, you know, jumping into a pot of boiling water, or or from, you know, engaging in risky behaviors that that easily could result in physical self harm. Yeah. Yeah. So okay, that's our, our fear of death has actually <laughs> kept us kept us alive. Alive, these, uh, millennia. Some, you know, in, in moderation or a healthy awareness, I think, of you know the, the the prospect of death. Yeah. 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 Something that you write in the book, I'm just going to read a, a bit of a quote from the book. You write, mourners who are able to make meaning of their experiences 
also exhibit lower levels of complicated grief and better mental health and physical health later on. In mm. fact, making, uh, making meaning after trauma is the most powerful predictor of long-term health outcomes. Mm-hmm. So can you explain that a bit in terms of how, sort of making meaning out of, out of loss? Yeah, that's what all the research shows. And it, 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 it dovetails very nicely into the field of what's known as post-traumatic growth, which is um, the phenomenon of, in a subset of, large subset of people who uh, experience trauma or loss and manage to turn that into a springboard for a sense of meaning and purpose in their life. Typically, it comes from us creating a story around the loss that has some kind of redemption in it, you know, where we can see either some positive outcomes of the loss or can frame it in a way that um, gives us some hope or some, you know, sense of purpose. Um, It is well known and well documented that those who are able to do that and are able to feel that either it happened for a reason or I can get right size with it, do have um, a, an easier time adapting to the loss later. But I find a lot of it comes from creating a story that feels intellectually and emotionally complete and carrying it forward. And then um, meaning can be meaning can really mean anything. It can be anything from feeling a greater sense of gratitude and appreciation for every day to becoming committing to being a better partner or parent. Um, to starting a foundation and raising $10 million in the name of your loved one. It really can be anywhere along that spectrum. And and I've seen all of those happen in clients and individuals. That's so interesting. Yeah, post-traumatic growth is something, Mm -hmm. everyone's heard of uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, but we don't often hear about post-traumatic growth. And actually, I love that idea of, creating a story that makes something meaningful and actually helps us to deal with that situation in a different right. way. And, and propels us out into the world to either be a better person, you know, in our interpersonal relationships or to do good in the world at large in through public service. Yeah, yeah. What about in terms of supporting other people who might be grieving? I think that... It can be one of those things, and I know you talk about this in the book, how people kind of will avoid the topic because they don't want to say the wrong thing. They don't want to remind the person or upset them. But actually, that's not the best thing to do. It's not good to avoid it, is it? No. I mean, I hear oftentimes, well, you know, I I wanted to express my condolences, but I didn't want to, you know, like call their attention to their loss. Well, they're well aware of their loss. They're thinking about it all the time. There's, um, I, I'd like to introduce your listeners to a, a term called companioning, which is relatively new in the bereavement world, but I think really relevant to your question. It's this idea of being a good companion to someone who's in grief. And really all that means is listening with curiosity and compassion and uh, without judgment or criticism or trying to impose your ideas of what grief should look like or how it was for you onto them. It's help. It's sitting while they are creating that story. When they're talking to you and telling you what happened or talking about their feelings, they are developing the story that they're going to carry forward. Ask some gentle questions. Um, Let them know that you're there. Create a safe space for them to be able to have to have someone to talk to, especially the younger people, because there's good evidence that young people need only one stable, consistent adult to talk to about their loss in order to adjust better over the long term than they otherwise would, just one. And that's often not a member of the immediate family because those people are in grief themselves. It's typically either a member of the extended family or a teacher or a neighbor or a coach or a family friend, someone who's willing to give that child the time and the space and the safety to express their feelings around their loss. It makes all the difference in the world. It really does. So asking curious questions and being a companion to them. I think that sounds, yeah, I think sometimes we we think that we have to like take their pain away or find the perfect thing to say to like help them. But actually that that seems like something that we can all do, you know, just to be there for that person. And also to remember that this is not a short-term experience. If a friend of yours loses a mother or a father, let's say in August or September, 
when mother or Mother's or Father's Day comes around the next year, they're thinking about that parent. You know, reach out and say, hey, I'm just thinking about you today, wondering how you're doing. I know it's your first Mother's or Father's Day without your father. That's all you have to say. It doesn't have to be a, you know, a grand pronouncement. You don't need to have all the answers or need to fix anything. Just, just knowing that someone's thinking about them and considered them on that day can really go a long way to helping your friend feel better on what was probably going to be a difficult holiday for them. Yeah, yeah, that's such a nice idea. What about the the five stages of grief? Because I know you've got um, kind of a, maybe a slightly different perspective on this. I think probably everyone's heard of the five stages of grief. What's can right. you share a bit about your your take on that? I can. Oh, I've got a lot to say. First, I want to start by saying that I think Elizabeth Kubler Ross was one of the most brilliant minds of the twentieth century. She really changed the way that we talk and think about death and dying. But what became known as the five stages of grief were originally, in her work, the five stages of dying. She had worked with terminally ill patients, and she noticed that those who were preparing for the end of their own lives went through, after a diagnosis, went through stages of denial, and then anger when they realized this is real, and then bargaining when they really understood or were told where it was headed. Um, denial, anger, bargaining, then depression when they realized they couldn't change it, and ultimately acceptance as they came to the culmination of their lives. And somewhere along the way, those stages were trans translated over to the mourners who were left behind, and they became the five stages of grief, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. And that isn't how grief works for most of us. I mean, yes, a lot of us feel angry. Yes, a lot of us try to make bargains. Yes, many of us feel what feels like depression because grief and depression are so similar. But it doesn't happen in that order. It doesn't happen one at a time, like in those silos. And even Kubler-Ross herself has said many times that's not what she intended. But there was such a seductive quality, I think, to this idea that we could move through five stages, which is not a big number, and well, we all really only have to move through four before you get to acceptance, right? Which is the goal. So four is even fewer than five. And the, you know, the popular culture just grabbed hold of that idea and ran with it. And it got out of Kubler-Ross's hands. And everyone started thinking, well, there's five stages of grief. And it really got folded into the common lexicon and consciousness in a way that I think did not serve us well in, the, in, in terms of bereavement because it set us up for expectations that um, were not going to be realistic for the majority of mourners. And it also sort of gave us a narrative shape that we tried to fit our stories into to lead us to a place of acceptance or closure or resolution that I, I think is a bit of a fantasy because in my experience, acceptance is a place that we often get to, and then we depart from it and we come back to it and we leave it again and we come back. And it's a very much a back and forth motion, not a final destination. So the 21st century grief, grief theory has really moved toward a model about that, that's more relational. It's about how to stay connected to our loved ones after they die. It's about feeling all the messy emotions of grief and also concurrently looking for ways to stay connected to them to make them a presence in our lives and the lives of those around us rather than an absence as we move forward. And therapists have found that this brings people a sense of relief, a sense of comfort, whereas trying to just move on or get past it or get over it was actually causing much more emotional pain than benefit for quite a number of decades. So interesting. Yeah, I suppose as human beings, we love an idea of, you know, five simple steps to kind of overcome your grief. Just do this, right. this and this. And, and that's just not exactly. the way we work, no. is it, at all? No, yeah. grief, the human, you know, the human spirit is way too complex to have four or five simple stages to move through to get to where we wish we could go. I wanted to lastly just ask you, if you wanted to share any advice for people who are experiencing that that after grief, they've lost someone a long time ago, and mm -hmm. they they you know want to to take some steps to to help themselves with that. What would you what would you say to them? Well, we have communities that are being built online right now that um, I think will give them a sense of solidarity with others because what I find is that people just want to know that what they're feeling is normal. 
and they want to hear, yeah, I've, I've felt that too. And here's what I do or what I did when that came up. You know, peer support, I think, is really essential. And on Facebook, there's an after grief community um, that's growing all the time that where these conversations are happening. And um, there are motherless daughters groups all over the world for women who've lost their mothers and want to explore the lingering effect it has on them, especially if and when they become mothers themselves. Um, I know also in the UK, there's there's some traction gaining now around the, the experience of what is known as adults bereaved as children. And the Winston's Wish charity is doing some work around that. I believe they have a, a page on their website. Um, a number of adults who experienced a loss in the past will find that it's very healing to volunteer for bereaved children and teenagers. And you've got terrific charities in the UK. You have Winston's Wish, you have Child Bereavement UK, Grief Encounter. All of these are places where you can donate time or effort because a number of people find it very beneficial and very rewarding to be able to give young people what they didn't have when they were young. Yeah, that sounds amazing. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Thank you so much for everything that you shared. Can you can you tell uh, the listeners where they can find out more about you and if they want to buy your book and anything else that you're offering? Absolutely. The UK version of The After Brief is coming out on March 4th and it's available on Amazon UK. Um, as well as other, through other retailers. I can be found at hopeedelman.com and also at theaftergrief.com. Amazing. Thank you so much. You're very welcome, Chloe. Thank you so much for the interview.